Our sermon title this morning is My Lord and My God, My Lord and My God, and we are in part three as we're working through the Gospel of John, beginning this morning, chapter one, verses one through five, where the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. And in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus Christ, according to John's gospel, according to the Bible, according to the testimony of God through Scripture, Jesus Christ is God incarnate. The theme of John's gospel is to display the incarnate Christ and all the glory and power and fullness of deity that dwells in him, dwells within him. He is fully man and yet not considering it robbery to be equal with God. And he is fully God, and yet making himself of no reputation to come in the likeness of men. Now John's emphasis here is on the heavenly perspective, as as we've talked about. Not a word out of place, not a word misspoken, not a word without purpose, without intention, without importance. The Holy Spirit, as the ultimate author of the Gospel of John, inspiring the words of this gospel through the pen of the human author, John, testifying of his divine subject, the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. John sets about in the task here in the opening verses and throughout the gospel of presenting Jesus Christ the embodiment and expression of the eternal Godhead, majestic, eternal, omnipotent, alone, wise, incomparable, ineffable, as the hymnist says, matchless, unconquerable, victorious, and all in the form of a bondservant coming in the likeness of men. And Jesus Christ is seen throughout the Gospel of John doing what only God can do. It's more testimony of his deity. In Genesis 1, it describes the creation and the attributes of creation to the power of God. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says that all things were made through Christ. Colossians 1 says that by Christ, all things were created. Hebrews chapter 1 says that the worlds were made, and then the worlds are sustained by Christ. Jesus Christ forgives and saves from sin, only that which God can do. In Psalm chapter 3, verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11, Besides God, God himself says, there is no Savior. In Titus chapter 3, verse 4, God, our Savior, saved us according to his mercy. Yet, in light of those passages about God saving, in Titus chapter 2, Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior, gave himself that he might save us. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, there is salvation in no one other than Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 2, In Luke chapter 7, Jesus has power on earth to directly forgive sins. It's blasphemy if he is not God in the flesh. Jesus Christ is God incarnate. In Ephesians chapter 1, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, Paul says. In Isaiah chapter 33, verse 22, God is our lawgiver. He's our king. He's our judge. In Matthew 25, all nations will be gathered together before the judgment of the Son of Man. He calms the sea. He controls the weather. He reads people's minds. He knows their hearts. He is Lord of Lords. Very God of very God, and yet very man of very man. Jesus Christ is called by the names of God in the Bible. He is, in John 20, my Lord and my God, with the definite article, the God, my Lord and my, the God, Take that, Jehovah's Witnesses. He is our great God and Savior in Titus 2, and he is our the great God. Take that, Mormons. He is the eternally blessed God in Romans chapter 9. He is wonderful, counselor, mighty God in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He is our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. And in the Greek, our the God. In Psalm 102, verse 24, the psalmist says, Oh, my God, do not take me away. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, the author of the book, Letter to the Hebrews, says that that was written of the Son. 
In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. And in Revelation 22, verse 13, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And Jesus Christ is rightly worshipped in Scripture as God. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only you shall serve. And in Matthew 14, when Christ calmed the storm, the disciples worshipped Him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. After His resurrection in Matthew chapter 28, the disciples worshipped Him. Jesus didn't rebuke them. He encouraged their worship. And although men are rebuked for worshiping angels, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6, angels are instructed by the Father to worship the Son. And in God, who says that he will not share his glory with another, answers the prayer of Jesus Christ the Son when he prays in John 17, Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus Christ is expressly stated to be God. Jesus is called by the names only used for God. Jesus possesses characteristics that only God can possess. Jesus does work that only God can do. And Jesus is worthy of worship and honor that only God deserves. Jesus is my Lord and my God. John wonderfully displays this truth in the opening words of his gospel in technicolor splendor. Uh, it's beautiful, profound, universe-shaking truth in words that a child would understand. And John picks up this beautiful diamond of who Christ is. He holds it up in the light, right, and just turns it in the light in front of a black backdrop so that we can see every cut, every facet as the light is reflected in that beautiful diamond. Just awesome to look at. We look at Christ that way here in the Gospel of John, and we're reminded by that that Jesus Christ came before a black backdrop. And John paints a picture of the glories and perfections and wonders of the person and work of Christ. And he paints that picture against the black backdrop of man's depravity. He came into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. We see how men in the Gospel of John respond to the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And how man in and of himself is dead in sins and trespasses. He is in darkness. He has a dark heart. How literally the God, the Godhead, has to do everything in salvation to redeem us. If anyone is ever saved, it is not by blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let that sink in for a moment. Is if anyone is ever saved... Ever to be saved, it is not of blood, nor, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. As we consider that black darkness through the Gospel of John, the diamond of all that Christ is, and the diamond of all that Christ has done, just shines all the brighter. And John writes so that men will simply look at the diamond and believe, that believing in Christ, you might have life in his name. You know, what you do with Christ is going to affect your eternal destiny. What you decide about Christ, how you respond to Christ, will affect your eternal destiny. And most people reject him out of hand. They just throw a, a wet blanket over the reality of who Christ is. They suppress the truth of him in their unrighteousness. And because Christ is God, to reject him as anything less than God is blasphemy. But many say they believe. And by the conduct of their lives, they deny him, as Paul said to Titus. They are lukewarm. And as such, Christ says that he will vomit them out of their mouth. Very few are born again of his spirit and transformed into his image from glory to glory. And as Christians, we pray that as we look at the Gospel of John and read through these verses, that we see Christ face to face, that we see and look into that diamond, see Christ, and that we are transformed into his image. We become like him because we see him, and one day we'll become just like him because we'll see him as he is. And so last week, we began looking at, looking at this diamond against this black backdrop. And we saw first, last week, that those facets of who Jesus Christ is, that he is infinite. In the beginning was the word. That's infinite in duration. If you look into eternity future, 
You see Christ there with no end. If you turn and look into eternity past, you see Christ there with no beginning. Christ transcends time, and he is infinite. We saw him as individual. The word was with God. He is his own individual, distinct person within the Godhead. He is God and yet distinct from God the Father. He is God and yet he is distinct from God the Holy Spirit. This is the glorious truth of the Trinity. We saw last week that he was indivisible, where the Bible says, and the word was God. Although he is distinct, he is indivisibly God. He is fully God. Though Christ is distinct from the Father, he is indistinguishable from God, distinct and yet indivisibly God. He is at the same time God and with God. As we come to verse 2, John says, in light of that truth, it is this one, it's that one, the one that I'm speaking of, the one who is infinite, individual, and yet indivisible, it is this one who was in the beginning with God. The Word who is God, the Word who was with God, it is He, it's that same one that was in the beginning, who is eternal. He was in the beginning with God. So as this week, as we consider, in verses 3 and 4 now, and 5, examining this diamond, we're going to see more facets. We're going to see Christ the Word now, who is one infinite, two individual, three, he is indivisible. Today he is also, in verses 3, 4, and 5, independent. Five, he is incarnate. And six, he is invincible. Infinite, individual, indivisible, independent, incarnate, and invincible. We could have a lot more ins that we could add there to describe Christ. Fourth point on your notes, he is independent. He was in the beginning with God. And what was he doing in the beginning with God? He was making everything. That's right, he was creating. Everything that exists, in verse 3, was made by Christ. So Christ, in making everything then, stands separate from all of that which is created. He himself, as uncreated, is independent from creation. If he's independent from creation, he is self-existent. He is self-sufficient. He's independent of all that is created. We'll see verse uh, point five, that he is incarnate. In verses four and five, he came into the darkness of this world as the embodiment of life and light. That's the purpose for which, he was, for which he came. The purpose for the incarnation was to come into the world as life and light. The life of God, the light of God in the flesh. The revelation of God in bodily form. And point six, he is invincible. As God in the flesh... Christ accomplished all that he came to do and even now reigns victorious at the right hand of the Father as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. The darkness did not and will not overcome him. So let's take a look at verse 3 first. Point 4 on your notes. He is independent. The Bible says in verse 3, all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. So he created everything. Everything you say, everything, everything was created by Christ. There's nothing that exists that Christ didn't create. Planets, yes. Galaxies, yes. A universe that if you traveled at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, would take you 13 billion years, as far as we know, to get across. Did he create that universe? Yes. Sky, skyscrapers, yes. He made skyscrapers. He made the stuff that makes skyscrapers. He gave us the brain to devise skyscrapers. He made the laws of nature, the laws of physics that made skyscrapers possible. Jesus Christ created everything. And there's a positive aspect to this. All things that were made were made through Christ. And there's a negative aspect to this. There is nothing that he didn't make. So John gives both the positive and the negative. The angels, he made them. <laughs> Heaven and hell. Yes, he made them. Time and space. Yes. Hebrews 1 said that it is Jesus through whom God made the ages. That word there. Cats. Yes, he even made cats. <laughs> you may say to yourself, I didn't think that God was the author of evil. Well, when God created cats, they were good. The cats are a result of the fall. So, <laughs> Cats were good when he made them. And one day he's going to make them good again. <laughs> you may say, 
Well, I thought the Bible taught that God made everything. Isaiah 42, chapter, uh, chapter 42, verse 5 says, Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it. That, of course, is true. The Bible says that God is the creator. And yet God does all of his creating through the agent of creation, Jesus Christ, the Son. Jesus Christ becomes the agent by which God creates all things. And verse 3 says there isn't one thing in existence that Jesus Christ didn't himself make. So what's the point of saying it that way? What's the point of emphasizing in this verse the positive and the negative and going to that trouble, so to speak, is to make the point that Christ is not and cannot be a creature, a created being himself. John, again, in verse 1, establishing the fact that Christ is God, in verse 2, reiterates and repeats verse 1 with a little nuance, saying that Christ is God in the flesh. As we come to verse 3, and he created everything, everything that has been made has been made by him, and there's nothing that exists that hasn't been made by him to say that he is independent of his creation to say again that Jesus Christ is God. He says it in such simple terms that a child could understand it. He is therefore God in the flesh. He cannot be a creature himself. He cannot be created himself. And as uncreated, he is God. He is independent from creation. This is the doctrine of God's aseity. God's aseity, his independence. He needs nothing. He is self-sufficient. He is self-existent. And this again, this aseity, is an attribute of God and God alone. He is independent. And each of these, as we discuss this about the word, keeps pointing back to deity, keeps pointing back to the fact that Jesus is God. The word was God. And get this. If the Word was God, and yet the Word was also the agent through which God did His creating, then the Word, again in verse 3, also has to be distinct from God the Father. So even in concept, he's repeating verse 1 in verse 3. In 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Individual, and yet indivisibly God. In verse 3... He is God the creator, and yet the agent of creation. God created everything through the Son of God. He is both God and with God, so to speak, both individual and indivisible. No matter how you keep looking at it, John just keeps pushing you toward the inevitable conclusion. We keep coming back to the statement of Thomas in John chapter 20, my Lord and my God. Now, that being said, now, if everything was made through Christ, and he sustains all things by the word of his power, then we, as created, are completely dependent upon him. He is outside of dependence on anything. He is self-sufficient, self-existent. He is independent. But we, as his creation, are dependent upon him for everything. If he created us and then sustains all things by his power, then in every possible way, we are dependent on Christ. We have absolutely no independence. And yet the wretched course of men from their very birth is that we live as if we do. We live, live as if we are independent, as if we rule ourselves and are accountable to no one. And when the rest of creation, the rest of his creation obeys him perfectly, we're the ones, the pinnacle, so to speak, of his creation, we're the ones who rebel against him, who become enemies of his by our wicked works. The truth of the Bible is that you are made. You are a created being, and as such, you are accountable to God, your creator, for the way in which you live your life. You were created for a purpose, to glorify God, but you rebelled against your creator. As such, we have plunged the entire world with our sin, ourselves, and all the creation, Plunge the entire world into futility because of our sin. Look with me at Romans chapter 8. Let's take a look at that. Romans chapter 8. And look down at verse 18. Romans chapter 8. Verse 18. Everything's been corrupted by our rebellion. We are created. 
We owe honor and glory and praise and worship and obedience to our Creator. And yet, from our very beginning, we have rebelled against God, lived for ourselves, and acted as if we were independent, acted as if we were self-sufficient and self-existent. And as such, everything's been ruined since then. In verse, chapter 8, verse 18, the Bible says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption. If you're in Christ, you want the adoption. You want to be glorified. You want to be fully and finally free from sin. Verse 24, for we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. The Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. We don't know how we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Even the creation is corrupted by sin, corrupted by our rebellion. And think about it. The creation loathes to give up its air for wicked sinners to breathe. It groans under the weight of doing that. The creation groans under giving up its harvest for food for wicked sinners who rebel against God. And it groans to be adopted, to be recreated, to be made anew. Our sin corrupted everything. Our sin is the reason there are weeds. Think about it. It's the reason there are lawyers. It's the reason that we have insect repellent. It's the reason that there's chemotherapy. Our sin is the reason there are such things as anti-venom and psychologists. All because of sin. Everything Christ created, everything that Christ created, all things that were created through him were created very good. He created us as good. Everything he cre created, including ourselves, we have corrupted with our sin. Think about it. As being depraved because of sin, you can't think straight. As being depraved because of sin, you can't reason correctly. As being depraved because of sin, your foolish heart is darkened. You are unwise. As a result of being corrupted by sin, you can't feel the way the Lord designed you to feel. Because you've been corrupted by sin, you can't imagine in the way that the Lord created your imagination. You are totally, in every faculty, you are totally depraved. You are depraved in every piece of you, so to speak. Totally depraved. The story of the Bible all points to God's plan for Jesus to purchase it all back and to make it anew, including those that will repent and believe the gospel. He recreates everything. You become a new creation in Christ, and one day fully glorified in Christ. It's interesting, the Bible says that those who turn from sin and place faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ are his workmanship, and look at this, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, for good works. Everything we do before Christ are filthy rags. But he created us, Christ created us in him for the purpose of good works. We are his workmanship. So in a world that is corrupted by sin, in a world that's dark, and men prefer the darkness because their deeds are evil, in a world that is dying and passing away, where men are dead in their sins and trespasses, in a world where there are cats and lawyers, God comes in human flesh and dwells among us. He dwells among us. He is incarnate. Point five on your notes. Christ is incarnate. He came, God, in the flesh to dwell among us. Verse 4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
John says he became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation means that he came in a human body. God, almighty God, the Lord of glory, came in a human body, wrapped himself in the mud of human flesh, traipsed through the dirt of this filthy world. In verses 4 and 5, the purpose of his incarnation, the reason that he came incarnate, is to bring life and light, the life of God and the light of God. So Jesus Christ in the incarnation becomes the embodiment of the life of God and the embodiment of the light of God. He came to bring life and light. Now, first thing I want you to do is tie those comments in verse 4 to the comments that John makes about the creation in verse 3. And you, came, and you come to the same conclusion. Just as he was the source of all that has been created... Jesus Christ is the source of life. It's amazing. It's just simple words how all of this ties together, and you can't escape it. It is all woven through the fabric here of what, is, what John is teaching in the prologue, that Jesus Christ is God. It all connects. If he is life, or if he is the creator, if he was the source of all that's been created, he's the source of life. He came bringing life. No one gave life to him, he has life within himself. He didn't acquire life from anyone, didn't acquire life from anything. He is self-sufficient. He is self-existent. He is independent, needing nothing. He is the source himself of life. Life exists within him. In all of that, he is infinite. He is individual. He is indivisibly God. He is independent and he is incarnate. He himself is the source of life. Life exists within himself. For that to be the case, the conclusion that you have to come to, if Jesus Christ is life, the source of life, then Jesus Christ is God. He is independent. Uh, he is God. Second, as the creator, Jesus Christ is the creator of physical life, mostly represented by the Greek word bios. That word, the Greek word there, is where we get our word biology, biological life, phys um, and this is one form of life, biological life, physical life. However, the word that he uses here in verse 4 is not biological life, it's zoe, it's spiritual life, it's soul life, so to speak. Uh, it pertains more to spiritual life, and it's that life in us that will never die. You now are created to live forever, and you'll live forever with eternal life, with spiritual life, or you'll live forever as an object of spiritual death. You'll never die in that way. So if you connect the two here, you connect the two, which is what you have to do, you have John speaking of spiritual life then and spiritual light. Jesus comes to men who are spiritually dead in their sins, and he comes bringing spiritual life. He comes to a world that is spiritually dark, where men love the darkness rather than the light. He comes to people who have darkened hearts, and he brings spiritual light. Life and light, connected concepts. Death is the absence of life. Not necessarily the opposite of life, but the absence of all life. In the same way that darkness, not really in the sense the opposite of light, darkness is the absence of any light. So Jesus Christ comes into a world full of dead people and their sins and trespasses, and he brings spiritual life, comes into a world that is dark, a darkened world into a world where you have darkened hearts. We have darkened hearts, and Christ brings light. So Jesus Christ came to bring life to dead men, and Jesus Christ came to bring light to darkened hearts. And this is miraculous power. It's miraculous power. The fact that Jesus Christ created everything, including this universe, is miraculous power. But the fact that Jesus Christ became incarnate, God in flesh, came into this world bringing spiritual life and spiritual light is even more unfathomable, awesome, miraculous power. To bring dead men to life, awesome power. You know, it was said there um, in World War II, the atomic bombs that were exploded, right? Massive, massive explosions. It is said that those massive explosions were brought about from the energy within a pea-sized amount of uranium. Immense 
unfathomable power in a pea-sized amount of uranium. And that is nothing, nothing compared to the power God in human flesh incarnate bringing the power of life and the power of light to dead dark men. It is an awesome power. God wrapped in human flesh bringing miraculous life. So John writes then, so that you understanding that and seeing that and believing that might have that spiritual life yourself. You might have life in his name. Apart from Christ, you need to understand that you are dead in your sin. Apart from Christ, you are dark and hopelessly in darkness because of your sin. And you are wandering into an eternal night. You are dark in your sins. What's the one thing that a, a dead man needs? He needs life. <laughs> he needs life. A dead man needs life. He can't do anything without life. Can a dead man believe? No. He needs life to believe. Can a dead man repent? No. He needs life to repent. Can a dead man follow? Can he trust? Can he obey? Listen, if you are not in Christ, and if Christ has not given you a new heart, and if you're not indwelt by His Spirit, and if you're not, because of the work of the grace of God within you, living wholeheartedly for Him, then you are in darkness, you are dead, and you need life. Life is the way that you repent. Life is the way that you believe. Life is the way that you follow, trust, and obey. When you come along to a dead man, and you poke him in and prod him, and you, you inject him with, or you try to, with some spiritual truth, what does a dead man do? He does nothing. He stinks. <laughs> he stinks. He lies there and stinks. Lazarus in the tomb, he stinketh. <laughs> That's why Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. Salvation is of the Lord. Cry out to the Lord to give you life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and have life. Let God breathe into you the spiritual life that Jesus Christ came into the world to bring. That life comes only through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 5, verse 21, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. In John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. In John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. In John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christ is the only source of life. Without Christ, the source of life, you will die. You'll die in your sins. And this life was the light of men in a dark world full of death and corruption to men who have dark and dead hearts. And in this darkness, illustrating ignorance and sin and error and shame and guilt, this eternal life comes as a laser light shining through the darkness. Christ steps into a dark room and flips the light on and dispels the darkness. Where the light is, the darkness runs. In the same ways that the, the rays of the sun emanate from the sun, in the same way that heat and light emanates from the fire, light emanates from the source of light. Life emanates from the source of all life. Apart from Christ, men are staggering blindly through a dark world. Don't know their right hand from their left. Eternal darkness lies ahead. The prince of darkness rules over this world. And he has veiled the eyes of the unbelieving lest they see and be saved. There's a veil of darkness that is draw, drawn over the spiritual life of unsaved people, of unbelievers. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. If you love your life, if you love your sin, if you love living for yourself, if you don't really want to be here because of your sin, you don't really have any interest in the things of God, 
Unbelievers don't want to come to a church like this because their sins will be brought into the light. Unbelievers don't want to have a conversation about the gospel because someone's going to expose their sin and bring it into the light. I remember going to see uh, on vacation once System of Caves in North Carolina. Went into the cave, really cool to look at, just neat to see. Went down into the caves, and as we're going down into the caves, we're getting farther and farther into the cave. Uh, they want to demonstrate to you how dark it is in that cave. And so you get down in there, and they turn the light off. And when they turn the light off, I mean, you literally cannot see there anything. It is a complete absence of light. You cannot see your hand directly in front of your face. There's no shadowy, there's nothing, no light. But if you were in that cave and you lit even a small candle, just a match, that cavern is going to be filled with light instantaneously. It shuns the darkness, sends the darkness running. The darkness will not overcome, not even that small flickering match light, will not overcome that small flickering candle. How less then will any darkness ever shroud the billions upon billion watts of electric light power that shines forth from the source of all light, Jesus Christ, that shines in the darkness. There's no room for any darkness at all. In that, point six, Christ is invincible. Christ is invincible. Verse five says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. There's a word at the end of that statement in verse five, did not comprehend, comprehended. That word there at the end translates the Greek word katalambano, katalambano. It doesn't necessarily mean comprehend in that sense. We view comprehend as it didn't understand it. it. It could mean that. But katalambano means more to the point that the darkness did not seize upon it, did not grasp it with both hands, did not overcome it, did not overpower it, did not overwhelm it. The darkness was not victorious over it. The darkness did not dispel the light. The darkness was powerless against the light. The light of Jesus Christ has come into the world, and the darkness of this work, wicked world cannot overcome it. Light always dispels darkness. You could say, additionally, of Christ, that in the face of that darkness, in the face of those odds, in the face of those enemies that array themselves against him, in the face even of your wicked, dark heart, in the face of all your sin, that Jesus Christ's light shines. In the face of enemies, Jesus Christ is not only invincible, he is incorruptible. In the face of darkness, in the face of sin, in the face of his temptation in the wilderness, where Satan barraged Jesus Christ with temptation, he is sinless. He's incorruptible. He's indivisible. He is indestructible. He is indomitable. He is ineffable. He is inextinguishable. He is invincible. Christ came to shine a light on the black backdrop of this world. But not just to shine a light on the black backdrop of this world. Christ came to shine the light on the black backdrop of your own heart, my own heart, dead in our sins, overcome by darkness we are. And Christ came to be victorious, to triumph over that where we can't. We're lost in the dark. We can't do anything for ourselves. We grapple and search and crawl, can't find the door. We crawl and grapple and search apart from Christ for our sin. Just want more darkness. Want to stay in the dark. And yet, Christ comes bringing the light of life, the life of light, the life and light of salvation to a dark world, to a dark-hearted, depraved men in such a way that not even the gates of hell can prevail against it. And as great as your sin is, greater is the light. 
as great as your depravity, as thorough as your depravity is, greater is the life that Christ brings. If you'll but believe, as John says on his name, that believing on his name, you might have life. You know, Herod tried. Tried to have all the babies murdered under the age of two because he wanted to put out the light. The Davidic line was reduced at one point to one king hidden by his mother so that Satan wouldn't put out the light. He tried to do it on the cross. And yet at the cross, light shines the brightest when the dark seems the darkest. And Satan thought he had victory and Christ says it is finished. Christ won the victory at the cross. And yet we as men and women, in light of that, live for ourselves, turn our backs and, and head into the darkness, and we'll continue walking in darkness and head toward an eternal darkness, rather than come into the light and receive cleansing and forgiveness a miraculous display, isn't it, of the darkness within our own hearts apart from him. You must turn from sin, turn from darkness, put your faith and trust in Christ alone to save you. You can't work your way out of the darkness. You are blind and you are dead. All you can do is put faith and trust in Christ. Believe on him as the life and light in this world. Trust him alone to forgive you, to cleanse you, to enable you to live this Christian life and follow him as Lord. And he'll give you an eternity in light, an eternity of life with all the saints in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, praise be to you, Lord, for life and light. Praise be to you, Lord, that you could have left us in darkness. We deserve it. God, we deserve it. We've chosen it. Uh, Lord, we've been completely corrupted, completely enveloped in it. And yet, you, God, in your great mercy and your great grace toward us, brought life and light in Jesus Christ, God the Son. We praise you, Lord. Thank you for that. We worship you uh, as God. And thank you for the salvation that we have in him. I pray, God, that we would live with our eyes just peeled on the light, God, just laser focused on the light. That we wouldn't become like those that live continuously in darkness, blind, but that we would just keep our eyes on Christ. But if there's anyone here, Lord, who's never come to the light, they're still trying to hide in some dark corner, pray, God, that by your grace and mercy that you draw them out, and give them life turn them to Christ and save them for your glory. All these things we pray in the blessed name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.